Welcome to Public Power Underground, Northwest Public Power's premier weekly infotainment program that covers Northwest public power and public power adjacent news from a power department's perspective. We started in hard times to bring us all in into the laughter through thick and through thin for public power enthusiasts without and within roll on enthusiasts roll on roll on enthusiasts this is season three episode two into the metaverse the theme of our third season is a sustainable new normal we're striving to be part of your new normal work routine when your boss stops by and sees you watching YouTube, be confident in your answer that it's work to watch. If you're working from home and your spouse, significant other, child, or roommate wonders why you're laughing, let them know that it's for electric utility enthusiasts like you. On today's show, we'll get an update on Northwest Power Markets on Aaron Reports, be brief on the summer market conditions with TEA's two fan, and as always, cover more public power and public power adjacent news. I'm the voice of the underground and economic development manager for Klatskin IPUD, Brian Fawcett. I'm Paul Dockery, the manager of the power department and co-host of Public Power Underground. This is Aaron Guillory, the star of Aaron Reports and co-star of Public Power Underground and accounting supervisor for Klatskin IPUD. And I'm the current office administrator for the Public Power Council, the publisher of Wire to Wire and editor at large and newest co-star of Public Power Underground, Karen Heim. Wire to Wire came out today, Karen. Did. I was just going to say that. Got it out for you guys because, you know, some some people get longer weekends than others. So <laughs> There's at least one Easter egg in there. There's at least one. <laughs> I'm excited to be back. It is great to be on being recorded with y'all. Uh, warms my heart. Warms my heart. Me too. I'm hoping I can knock the rust off a little bit. It's not too disjointed. <laughs> we get, you get you get at least a couple of gimmies in there, Brian. <laughs> Perfect. All right, we will uh, we'll just get right into it then. We're starting this week, like most weeks, checking in on power market indicators in the Northwest with our first segment, Aaron Reports. Ooh, great. Let's get into it. This is Aaron Reports, where we try to get up to speed on Northwest market. I'm a lot more excited about this than I thought I would be. Uh, Northwest market indicators for September 16th, 2021. I'm Aaron Guillory, and I've got your market update for the week. April, September flows, the Dallas are expected to be at 82% of normal, and the outflow at the Dallas peaked over the past week at 116.9 KCFS on September 9th at 1800 hours. Day ending elevation at Grand Coulee on September 15th was 1278, and peak outflow this past week hit after the PPU September 10th at 96 KCFS at 2100 hours. Spot market power in the Northwest for delivery September 16th is at $82.33, with gas at $5.55 per MMBTU, translating to a spark spread of 43.50 and heat rate of 14,834. In term markets, balance for the month for mid C is now at $74 per megawatt hour. Mid C power for December 2021 is up to $106.55 from $81.25 last Thursday with Sumas gas at $761, translating to negative $761, translating to a heat rate of 14,000. Looking at fish counts at Bonneville Dam. Uh, steelhead are trending up. 925 steelhead passed through the Bonneville Dam yesterday. Chinook and coho salmon counts continue to exceed preseason forecast. 131,098 coho and 266,051 66, Chinook have crossed Bonneville so far this year. Spending a beat at Bonneville's balancing authority. Peak load this past week was at 6,467 on September 12th at 1835 in the p.m. Uh, during loads peak, hydrogen was at 5,365. Wind gen was at 1,904 megawatts. Conventional units were at 1,202. That's 1,202. And nuclear was at 1,139 megawatts. Enzo for the June, July, August period sits at a negative 0.4 uh, oceanic Nino index. The SST consolidated Nino forecast indicates that we're likely to remain in La Nina through spring 2021. This week in NOAA climate forecasts, the six to 10 day outlook has temp below normal for the region, precipitation in the region above the normal range. Their 90 day report shows precipitation in the normal range and a chance of above average temperatures. Special thanks to Answergy for letting us use their dashboards for and reports and to Luji for collecting and compiling the data for the report. And that's all we've got for this update. Tons of good information like normal. 
Thank you, Aaron. No, no Two rust things. for Aaron to knock off. He was on it. A little bit of rust. One note: the, the natural <laughs> gas prices were not negative. The, the parentheses in the script. We got to take the parentheses out. Okay. All right. You got to keep. <laughs> yeah. For those of you who are only listening, just you know, pan to that moment. YouTube, where my face goes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. and, and also, second thing, uh, the NOAA climate forecasts have a f f fancy new styling in their graphics. Is That's this, nice. That is very fancy and nice. Very I think nice. it updated literally today because when <laughs> I looked at them yesterday, was not fancy. <laughs> It still Love takes it. me a good couple minutes to understand what each of those is actually doing, but uh, rain on the way, I think, is the main thing. Main that take. is the main thing. I've heard as much as a couple of inches here in Klatskanai and uh, maybe a few out at the coast. Yes, I saw we're going from uh, summer weather to end of November weather in this week. So just like I'm that, it. just like that. Love it. I'm not complaining. <laughs> I'm hoping to be sitting in a hot spring while that rain is coming down this weekend. Oh, no, he's got plans. So. Definitely good. got plans. We don't need to make other people feel bad about not having plans. Okay, Brian? <laughs> On our we'll Friday, find a hot spring. I mean, There's plenty Karen, of them around. Karen's already throwing us under the bus. Oh, y'all get Fridays off. <laughs> no, like, we work 40 hours in four you know, days. Paul, you do. You, know you guys should not feel shame. And you, you guys get on way earlier than I do. So that's, <laughs> there you go. Brian's <laughs> over here like, oh, I'm going to be in a hot spring this weekend uh starting on friday and we'll just point that out <laughs> well Great. not actually till saturday or sunday but you there are other, other I'm things not even, going on tomorrow you know i don't what? even have plans better. tomorrow i'm just gonna waste it i'm just, just gonna have a friday it. off <laughs> just like just like throwing time around she doesn't even care <laughs> <laughs> okay well uh let's uh we ready let's move on yeah, on that note, uh, next up is our weekly walk through Northwest Public Power and Public Power Adjacent News in a segment we like to call Public Power Desktop. Show us your desktop, Paul. All right, he's bringing up me. The California Energy Commission approved licenses for five emergency gas generators, each with a capacity of 30 megawatts. These licenses expire in five years and plans call for generators to be installed at existing power plants in Roseville and Yuba City. <laughs> California utilities have uh, been stressed in recent years as a result of a range of climate-induced maladies, including extreme heat, drought, and raging wildfires. California has the authority to install all new ge electric generation under the state's emergency, uh, the state of emergency declared by Governor Gavin Newsom on July 30th, when California was facing extreme power supplies uh, shortages as the entire West was experiencing a heat wave. The state's emergency order allowed it to be installed, allowed uh, the natural gas fired generating units to be installed without regular permitting, including, uh, including environmental impact reports and hearings. These typical process would take up to, could take months or even years if they were con contested. They're expected to be operational by mid-September. To learn more, you can read the article by Bri Brianna Provenzano found in Gizmodo, as Paul is showing us, or the Sacramento Business Journal. Thanks to Underground's own Ian Bledsoe for summarizing the article. Uh, if there's any errors, let him know. And Paul, maybe we should think about getting Michelle Bertolino, Electric Utility uh, Director for City of Roseville and Public Power Underground Live guest back on the podcast to talk about it. We should we should have brought this up during the live broadcast. If you know, a live lot of things going. It was on a lot of stuff broadcast. happening, but a lot of things happening. Um, but now she but, said she would come back, and now we have the perfect opportunity to bring her back. Exactly, they're putting in LM twenty five hundred. What what do you? How do you think you pronounce this? The GE LM twenty five hundred. That'd be my guess. Okay. That'd, that'd be Let's my guess as well. Two of them, sixty total megawatts. Yeah, I, I, know, I find this never pronounce things correctly on here. <laughs> <laughs> I find this fascinating for a number of reasons. One, how quickly they are going to do it. And uh, I'm sure there are more than a few people out there saying, I, I told you so. Or uh, maybe the better commentary is this just shows the importance of having flexible resources to integrate renewables and deal with other um, issues on the grid. Yeah, the Northwest has this massive benefit of a massive hydro system with flexibility. Bam, good for us. Good for us. Well done, you know, the people in the 1930s who installed them. Good job by you. <laughs> Good job, 1930s. <laughs> Good job, 1930s. Okay, I think we're ready. Typewriter. All right, returning to the underground to talk about the state of energy markets in the Northwest is the Director of Power Trading in the West for the Energy Authority and the underground's Chief Metaverse Correspondent, Tufan. 
Hey, two, welcome to Public Power Underground again. How you doing? I'm good. This is the third season. We're going for return to normal, sustainable new normal. Um, you were on the second season. Really great, really great discussion about NFTs as, as long as some other market stuff. Uh, really loved our conversation last time. Wanted to have you back to talk about markets. Are you excited about this? Yep. Glad to be back. Um, our, so over the summer and what we're trying to do kind of is to re, re debrief on what happened over the summer. There was a lot of events in the Northwest. We had the heat dome event that was very much situated in the Northwest. We had a couple high priced periods in June and July. And then again, just this last weekend, there was another high priced, uh, couple days. So can you kind of give me in like a couple minutes, two to three minutes, what your take on, take has been from the past summer and maybe what you're looking for, uh, over this fall and coming winter. Sure. Um, well, it's no secret heading into the summer, uh, market had plenty of reasons to be fearful. Uh, you know, more patterns of extreme weather across the country, uh, integration of renewables, and just like a general um, kind of heightened uh, approach to, to risk management. I think, uh, you know, a lot of the market participants were, were taking uh, just kind of uncertain how markets would react to these things colliding. Uh, and, you know, we saw, you know, prior year, some rolling blackouts in California. We saw extreme weather in ERCOT from the winter storm. And the and market was wondering how the West would react to, to a very hot summer. Um, you know, the months leading into it, you know, significant amount of risk premia being priced into the forward contracts. Uh, just market trying to, de to decide, you know, what was fair value uh, in the event of, you know, however many days of, of extreme weather. Um, you know, how, how that would materialize. And I think, you know, you know, we did see uh, multiple events, you know, many records were set uh, across the Northwest, uh, across a handful of days from a temperature perspective, um, even from a price perspective in, in, in certain days and certain hours. Um, but I think for the most part, um, you know, we, we made it out uh, pretty good uh, and below expectation. Um, so I think I was looking at a chart the other day of real time prices compared to day ahead prices compared to forward prices and, and, and real, and the, the, the closer you went down to the actual flow of the megawatts, you know, the prices got cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, which means the market, um, you know, was preparing for the worst. And, and what we got was, you know, not quite, not quite the worst. Um, so I guess the question now is what happens from here? Are all these problems fixed? And I, I think the answer is no. I think we, we, we got extremely lucky. Um, you know, we did have some areas of where heat was coincidental, uh, where the nightmare scenario is it gets hot everywhere and, you know, infrastructure just starts to fail, whether it's transmission, you know, power generation, you have it, you name it. But, um, you know, we, we, we made it out in one piece. Um, but I, I don't think these problems get solved overnight. And I think the risks, you know, going forward are still, still, still there. And, and these things are, you know, these problems won't get solved quickly. And so I think it's um, prudent to, you know, to learn from what happened, regroup and, and, and still approach, approach the summer months with, with uh, high caution. Uh, I'm wondering, so we saw a lot of the price pressure in the forwards in Q3, the July and August period. Um, as we're looking at this winter, I think natural gas prices for December are like five or six bucks at Sumas. What, what is your read on, um, are these largely going to be summer risks that we're mitigating uh, or will that kind of spread into the winter? And because the Northwest season, we're a more nor winter peaking region. Is it largely because California and the Southwest drive this bigger risk um, that, that the summer will continue to be the pressure point? I think the key difference is that in summer you have you have risk coming from 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 multiple from from all, ar all across WEC, right? Like California can drive price action, Desert Southwest can drive price action, even SPPP Montana, you know, you know, high load there. Um, there is still price, certainly a, a, a large amount of price risk uh, in the winter too. Like you mentioned, we are winter peaking here in the Northwest, but I think these issues become a lot more localized in the winter. You know, you don't see cold snaps in Southern California and the desert Southwest, but you're hyper-focused on, on where these things land in the Northwest. Uh, and to your point about gas, I mean, um, you know, gas prices are supported from a macro perspective from, from a couple of different things. You're not, 
the, the, the primary driver, I think, for the Northwest will be from power generation, power generation demand, you know, and especially with um, a lot of these, uh, you know, coal plants being, being offline and, and the baseload stack being, you know, heavily uh, skewed towards natural gas uh, fire um, generation. Uh, you also have this aspect of, you know, what are LNG exports doing? You know, there's, there's also a high amount of uh, demand for gas overseas that creates support at, at Henry Hub and just, you know, a little, not completely correlated to, um, to the price of Sumas gas, but definitely supportive of, of, of gas prices in general, so. Uh, and I'm curious, uh, you know, the, the July and August um, dry, fears driving prices, um, largely was driven, I, in my perception was by the August out, uh, outages in California in 2020. Do you, you know, we, we could have, you spoke to the increased uh, occurrences of these high, like variance climate change related weather events, right? That um, that aren't necessarily just because more heat, but you know, Texas saw that great big freeze last year. Um, do you think a winter event like what Texas saw, where there's just massive cold across the West, could could make uh, winter prices, the fear index in winter months, uh, big like the fear index in August, July, and August was this year? I'll just say this, I think like there's no better time to be a little bit of an alarmist uh, when, when trying to think of like uh, the different scenarios that could play out across the power markets. Um, and those two events just in general, I think just give you pause, right? You have a rolling blackout event and a freak winter storm that no one really saw coming. Um, and to just, it, it, I, I think would be, uh, you just can't ignore uh, that these things are not typical and um, and could very well happen again. So. And there may be a new normal and we should try to make it sustainable. Oh, you see what I did there? <laughs> I'm going to do something else. I'm going to do something else. Watch this. Yeah. Maybe we can flee into the metaverse. What is the metaverse, too? <laughs> what is the metaverse? And I don't think we can flee into a metaverse. And will this create more electric demand? This is all questions I have. To me, I think... Taking a step back, I guess, if you look at um, kind of how we've evolved as a society and as a species, right? Like the, the, the amount of time we spend online, whether through a phone or through a screen, uh, it's just, I, I, if you were to chart it, I think it's, you know, it's, it's growing over time. Um, you know, we're spending more and more time in online communities, communicating online, um, just our presence on the internet uh, yeah, even, you know, all day, COVID every is, day, right? <laughs> yeah, Zoom, Slack, you name it. Um, you know, that I think the trend is just upward. Um, and I, I think that's the metaverse is any, any part of your life that you spend, um, kind of digital online digitally. Um, I would, I would classify that as a metaverse. Uh, and I think what's happening is, is as, people are realizing that this is more and more kind of what the trajectory is. They're experimenting with, you know, how, how do humans, um, how will humans spend their time uh, and their energy and, and their money? Digitally, in Digitally. bits. Yeah. We talked about NFTs last time. Is there any tie in between an NFT and the metaverse? Like, do I get to use my, that's part of my experience is I have these NFT rocks so if the metaverse is simply another kind of domain for you to spend your energy and your time then an nft is what people are what an nft is is an experiment in what if i were to spend all my time in the metaverse what does an asset look like in the metaverse or what does Ooh. property look like in the metaverse and um, like, how, do, how does that thing manifest itself? Boom, that just blew my mind. That is great. Yeah, I hadn't thought through, it's really about property in the metaverse. It's about property in this digital world um, and ownership of something that is a bit, you know, characterization of a bit, so. Love to have you, will you come back? This is great. You're really good at this. We should do more of this. <laughs> yeah, Any, anytime you like, yeah, yes. happy to come back. Thanks again. Great, great talking with you. Please come back.
Yep. Now back to the underground for more news. Okay, moving on. Tech Explore published an article by Pacific Northwest National Lab's Tim Ledbetter on September 13th about a PNNL study on the operation of heat pump water heaters, specifically exploring the water heater's load shifting ability. For those unfamiliar with the term heat pump water heaters, usually published with the acronym HPWH, they operate like space heaters extracting heat from the surrounding air and transferring it into the tank holding a home's hot water, which makes it more energy efficient than traditional units using an electric resistance element. The team observed the use of heat pump water heaters placed in different households located in various areas over time. The goal of the research was to establish electrical load shapes that would allow them to understand how those water heaters affect the energy system and the potential impact in building an efficient energy system. The results of the research show that their effect on the energy system depends on different factors such as size of the household or the amount of time spent at home. You can read the article titled Load Shifting Potential of Heat Pump Water Heaters Studied on Tech Explore's website and find the published findings titled Factors Influencing Electric Electrical Load Shape of Heat Pump Water Heaters in the ASHRAE Journal. Special thanks to the underground's own Luigi Jeline for summarizing the insightful article. Well done. So when I first saw this article, I was actually thinking of it as like, oh, are they trying to leverage like the smart capabilities of a heat pump water heater to shift load? But that was uh, not true. No, a thousand percent false. No, a thousand percent false. Uh, instead, uh, it's just studying if you have a heat pump water heater, how will that shift your load? Because it operates differently than a standard water heater. Good distinction and actually really important for analysts in the region who want to understand their load shapes because they give you some indicators, the variables to use to better predict the load shape. And if we had AMIs, maybe it would be useful for us, but we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, with uh, regional dialogue in full swing about the framework for a provider of choice contract after the current agreement with BPA expires in 2028, Product ideas are floating around the region. Joining us to chat about some post-2028 product design ideas is the CEO of PNGC Power and a returning champion of the underground, Roger Gray. Hey, Roger. Welcome back to Public Power Underground. Hey, Paul. Nice to see you again. Great to see you again. You've got a lot of changes at PNGC in your leadership team. I don't know if it's a lot, but noteworthy. you got some new people. Yeah, we sure do. It's like we lost, uh, I lost three quarters of my leadership team in a matter of months, but we've replaced everybody, lost great people, but we are also got some great people. Yeah, Erin Urban, really excited about her. And then Michael Jung, am I saying that Mike, right? Mike Jung, yeah, Jung? Michael Jung. Um, and uh, and Craig Silverstein's our general counsel, uh, not an employee, but a, a contract general counsel back east. That's great. Yeah. You, got, you got to do some recruiting. Yeah, recruiting in virtual world, always fun. <laughs> it's very different, very different. Well, if you don't mind, let's dive into it. So, you know, my perspective on this uh, kind of post-2028 process is I wasn't part of the regional dialogue uh, contract development. It's a new process for me, and I'm still working through. I love to learn from the more experienced people in the region. Experienced, not old, just experienced, right? Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, I'm still developing like my philosophical approach, but one that I propose ready for edit, but it's, it's kind of one of those philosophies that for public utilities like Klatsk and I, or, um, uh, like Bonneville, which is a federal agency who, whose products, um, are meant to be, to, uh, be recovering their revenue requirement. If you're a cost-based organization like us, where you're, obligated statutorily required to recover your revenue requirement the product development is actually one of the most critical components to figuring out the competitiveness of your business and and of your your product so i come with that kind of philosophy that this product development is incredibly important and you have actually it seems like spent some time thinking about products in this uh, provider of choice contracts so if you're willing um can you kind of give a summary of your, uh, what is it, fair share of core system concept and, and what you're going with there? Yeah, well, so, so first in the interest of full disclosure, I was not around for the, the uh, 2007, 2008, 2006 timeframe when the current contracts were negotiated. I came up here in 2010. 
but I spent a lot of time talking to people who led those negotiations, you know, and trying to understand what were the motivations. I actually have gone through several cycles of BPA contracts to understand how things have changed. And because, you know, history is important. I like to look forward, but I also, before we look forward, look back and understand what, uh, what we did well and what we did incorrectly. So you're right. Products really are really important, the competitive factor. And what I see emerging, and this this has taken place over time, it, and, you, and you, you know, the slice group that you're part of, I learned a lot from you all. You're really looking at that product. And what I see is lots of people looking at product. And what I, I see is there's some convergence and there's some divergence. But in the end, the BPA, I call it this core system, you know, the FCRPS and the nuclear plant. It is what it is. We can't change physics, and and we can we can influence it like you know make you know, make good asset investment decisions and maintain things properly and things like that. But it then becomes it becomes an issue of there's a, I think this thing is incredibly precious and valuable, and we're all going to be competing you know trying to jockey for position to get those things. So we share that sentiment of like the value of yeah, this thing yes. that we have in the region. Yeah. So let's preserve that value. Let's deal with the uncertainties and risks around the, around that. But as I said, just to start things simple and to align interests, whatever that system is, let's have a process to divide it up into a starting point, not an ending point, starting point, single product, a set of products, if you will, energy capacity, attributes, all the things, whatever it is, let's divide that up. And then what I call is, and so then we get custom, all BPA customers start with that starting point. We're all aligned in some respects, but in the end, you know, that product probably doesn't meet, frankly, anybody's needs. It, what you need and what I need and what Seattle City Light needs are all probably different, but we start with the starting point and then we have time to convert that product into the things that we need and desire. So if you as a slice uh, customer say, I want to take that starting point and convert it into something that meets your needs, great. If City Light has something they want to convert, great. And we let, frankly, an innovative marketplace, including BPA, what I call energy services, be part of that. But let's start with something simple, because right now, what I am concerned about, Paul, is we're marching down a path towards making Bonneville all things to all people. And we're going to end up with, what I my worst case fear is we're going to end up having multiple things that are allocated multiple different ways. And we're going to have a rate making and, frankly, unaligned set of interests and we're going to be like, no, those slicers are getting more value. They should pay more. No, those load following people are, going to, are getting more. And, so, and I don't want to have that. I want to start with something really simple. And then we all are responsible for asking BPA ourselves or a third party to take that basic product and convert it into what we really need. And we, we all, we, there are models out there. We all, we can see it. Uh, and if someone wants to ask BPA, hey, create load following for me, I'm all for it. But I don't want to have an argument about whether load following subsidizing or being subsidized or whether slice is being subsidized or subsidizing. So, so that's it. Yeah. So it, it, if I'm understanding it right, the concept is, you know, a allocate once on one thing. And, and the concern is if you're allocating one thing that is precious, we agree it's precious on multiple factors, you end up with disjointed products that don't mesh well together because we only have one system that can only do you know, that does a bunch of things, but can only be shared once. Exactly. Like, so you and I know, I mean, this, even like the discussion, which I think is a, the wrong discussion about, do we allocate the system on critical water or some other version of critical water? That's an, that's like a 20 year old energy based concept, you know, as a planner and a resource, you know, you're a professional in this. I, I still understand it. Capacity is really, really limited and precious and valuable. I don't want to have a discussion about 6,000 or 7,000 or 6,800 or 7,200 megawatts. I want to have a discussion about the entire nameplate system of that entire system because that is incredibly valuable to all of us. And if we have like capacity being allocated one way and energy being allocated a different way, we're going to get into all the who's subsidizing and who's being subsidized arguments. And I just want to simplify that whole mess and say, we all get the same thing. So we get the, we get the capacity allocated one uh, on the same basis as the energy and the attributes and everything else let's keep us really simple and then uh, you know another point of our 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 concept that we're rolling out is we all share a set of risks and uncertainties between ourselves and bpa and i see no effort right now to to have fundamentally address those like the residential exchange and this fish mess that we've got 
that's where we should be putting our energy into solving these big uncertainties because they're they're like hundreds of millions of dollars per year and we can sit there and tweak and tweak and and uh on the margin things like uh what do I want my product to look like? But if we if we don't deal with those uncertainties, we're not going to be happy with any of these products if we don't deal with those uncertainties. Yeah, I think I've heard in in, in a couple of forums, you know, the biggest risk uh, to a new contract with Bonneville is fish costs and residential exchange, right? Yeah. Those are the real cost pressures that can move this uh, uh, beyond. But for for this, I, I, I want to get back to your concept of it's it's one allocation and, and shared amongst customers. And, and you're thinking of that as it, kind of priced it like an embedded cost, right? We're allocating it out, whatever your allocation is, your share of the embedded cost of the system through a tariff process. Did I understand that right? Kind of exactly. For that one product? You know, I'm not a lawyer, but I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express. So um, the, sorry. Uh, we, we have, as preference customers, a right to the federal system at cost that that is the grand bargain and so whatever it's, it's it's no different than running a monopoly utility whether you're class can i or you know another utility you're regulated either by your own board and you we stick to cost-based principles for where yeah and uh, you know even the investor-owned utilities are cost-based recognizing they have a you know a, a share uh, a shareholder profit but they're still cost-based uh and that's the basic concept of bonneville and so i'm saying we have a preference right I would like to assert my preference right to obtain all the attributes and features of that system at cost. In the end, I want to work closely with Bonneville to manage those costs to mitigate the risks associated. Like this, you know, specifically the, the big two are the residential exchange and the fish. But we in Bonneville should be totally aligned on managing those costs and, and, and mitigating those risks. And on this fair share of the core system, I'm getting it right. I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. Um, you mentioned that if you want additional products and services, power services can offer them. Do you expect or in your vision of the concept, are those products offered by uh, the power services um, set in the tariff? Or do you think it's more like uh, we're going to go to third parties, we're going to go find other vendors and Bonneville power services can compete on price with those other vendors for additional services to move it from uh, this allocated system to something like a load following product, for instance. Yeah. So everybody that that basic fair share of the core system, there might be someone who it, it perfectly meets their needs. But I'm, I start with the assumption that it meets on, on a standalone basis, doesn't meet fundamental needs, whether you're a class can I city light or, you know, a, a, a co-op in Montana, for example. So the there are three models I see. One model is you self-manage it, manage it. That's very much like what slice customers do today. Because conceptually, this is like getting a slice of the system, but I call it fair share because slice has got a, a lot of connotations to it. There's history uh, there. Yeah, yeah, see, yeah, but I'm calling it fair share. So, but conceptually, it's like slice. Just self-manage it. You know, so the slice customers have to take that thing. Sometimes it's too much. Sometimes it's too little. And you all, and you're, you, that's where you are. You manage that and you deal with it uh, on a, so that's one option option two is higher bpa energy services and i'm really careful about energy calling this a different it's a different concept energy services they do have some statutory limitations as well as some benefits but basically you say bpa could you manage this for me very clo the closest model to, i would call to that is load following so you hire bpa to basically say can you create a load following one or same concept, but hire a third party. And there are multiple people who can do that for, for us as well, that are third party services that have some of the advantages that BP energy services might have, and they may have some of the disadvantages and they may have different sets of them. Um, but have yeah. you thought in the concept about whether the, if you're ha having Bonneville energy services hiring them, whether it would be like at a price set in the tariff, like a tariff rate, or is it, and they're like contracting with the trading floor to provide me a requirement service. But yeah. So calling it something different kind of. Have you thought about that? Because that's interesting to me. Yeah. That's really the, a, a very important set of details. Again, BPA Energy Services, they may have statutory obligations that limit how they may, they may be required to provide certain services that are cost based services under the 1980 Act, for example. But they, some of them just may be pure market. And if you think about this, think about our tier one, tier two tier two concept. Tier one is the cost-based concept. We all recognize what, whether you ask, whether you, whether you go out and acquire your tier two power yourself, or you ask BPA to acquire it for you, it's really a market-based product in the end. Really, everything's there's some kind of magic to BPA providing tier two. 
There really isn't. Is that's, so the basic concept is the core system that comes from the 1937 Bonneville, you know, the Preference Act and all that stuff. And that's the cost-based piece. And then, the, then if you ask energy services to, to do other things, uh, there may be some cost-based elements, but I suspect most of them are going to be market-based just like they are today. I mean, you know, it, it, it's conceptually, I'm trying to create a, I, I, I don't use tier one system because that's got a, a lot of connotations, but I would say that our fair share concept is basically a tier one kind of more close to a slice concept. It's a slice of everything. Now the difference is as you as a, I think you all are slice customers, yeah. you aren't getting the whole thing today. You know, that's, that's, that yeah. slice allocation was very constrained based on a constrained system. My argument is let's take the whole system, you know, everything. So, and it, energy basis is very different than capacity basis. That capacity is, we all really, really want that in the future we're going to. This RA world, the resource adequacy world, we are going, capacity is going to become king and capacity, frankly, is gonna be really, really hard. We all know that. I mean, we can't build batteries like California can uh, to solve our problems. That, that hydro capacity is so precious. Um, and that's where, you know, our IRP, our, our integrated resource plan tells us, figure out the capacity equation first, and then everything else will become relatively straightforward. Uh, great conversation, some great insights. I wanted to talk about the concept of a virtual RTO ISO, but we ran out of time because yeah. uh, it was, I, I love this kind of the, the product design, especially power products. It's it's uh, what I'm passionate about and love talking about, but maybe I can convince Alex uh, to come talk about virtual RTO ISO as your, your transmission guru. Maybe we can talk about that sometime yeah. if it's okay. We, we definitely like that. We want a real RTO ISO, but a virtual one's a good backstop. So thanks, Paul. It's always good to check in with you. Yeah, and you should probably make sure Michael and Aaron know that I'm gonna force them to be friends of the underground. You're gonna, you're gonna give them a heads up? Oh, they aren't, they, they aren't there yet? They haven't signed up? No, I'm, but it's, you know, uh, I haven't forced them to sign up yet, so I'll get on. I, I think that was in their position descriptions. <laughs> yeah. And so does that mean it's in the position descriptions to come on? Because we'd yeah, love to have yeah. some new celebrities. That's great. Uh, absolutely. I, they would love it. So thanks, yep, Paul. We're going to get you that belt, on. Roger. We're going to get you the belt. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks Stay safe, okay? Back. Good you to see too. you. Bye. Now back to the underground for news. All right, rulemaking for the American Rescue Plan's broadband eligibility is ongoing. The definition of what it means to have broadband is currently being contested. The current definition set by the Federal Communications Commission in 2015 sets the bar at at least 25 megabits per second download and three megabits per second upload. Some groups hope to raise the bar on what it means to be broadband to 100 upload and 100 download. The change in definition could increase the number of locations eligible for funding from 11 million under the current definition to 82 million households. On behalf of Paul, we'll just say yes, please, any, all of it, please, all of it. Just please do better than DSL, please, please. Please, please do better than DSL. It's so slow, so slow. I will second that notion. Yeah, we're trying to stream, we're watching C currently. We're like trying to get through some C uh, on Apple TV. Apple TV is great. Um, and it just stops every once in a while. It's very hard to watch television on, on DS. Apple TV, home of Ted Lasso. That's as exactly well. right. If watchers already did not like that. <laughs> yep. Maybe every time we get a Ted Lasso, we can like, uh, we can get a barbecue sauce. <laughs> Nailed it. Good job. Good job. Okay. All right, this week, the Northwest Power and Conservation Council released a draft of their 2021 power plan, the eighth such, such power plan for anyone keeping score. The plan outlines a path to keep the lights on for the next 20 years in a future where the one certainty is rapid change as more renewables vie with reliability. And climate change threatens re reliance on the historical record to make informed decisions about the future. For more information on the findings and recommendations of the plan, visit northwestcouncil.org. And for those of you who don't recognize his handiwork, this summary was provided by Ian Bledsoe. For those of us who are used to his writing style, we knew. We got it. I'm really loving this soundboard. Oh. I was gonna say, you are. <clears throat> I just Good need to call you. out. 
Ian doesn't like when I called out you, Karen, to do the soundboard for me, but it is a bit from a podcast I very much enjoy. And so uh, I very much encourage all of you to call out uh, if you want me to do a soundboard. I'm here for it. That's why I'm here in some ways. That's why I'm here. (laughs) All right. The top story this week in Clearing Up is by friend of the underground, Casey Mahaffey, on this year's concerningly low steelhead runs. According to the article titled High Columbia Temperatures Worry Steelhead Watchers, returns of both hatchery and wild A-run steelhead are the lowest on record. Quoting the article once again, scientists and fishery managers say the low steelhead's ocean experience is likely the reason for the drastically low A-run. For those of us unfamiliar with A-run and other B-run, so if you're not Brian Fawcett, uh, B-run and other ones, uh, A-run are the earlier returning fish smaller than 31 inches that return after just one year in the ocean. There's no simple way to summarize the incredibly well-reported story that cites several scientific studies and includes direct quotes from many technical experts, but the underground is still foolishly going to try to do it. Uh, So let's do it this way. High water water temperatures in the ocean and in the rivers reduce steelhead survival. Bottom line. It's a good bottom line. What's the fishing like out there, Brian? Uh, Well, it is currently closed for any steelhead fishing. Chinook and coho, pretty dang good, but... uh... It's closed for steelhead and I'm not really complaining because I like chasing them in Idaho anyways. And this just means more make it back to Idaho. And are lots of people going to Idaho? Is Idaho open? Idaho will likely be open as long as the B run does exceed its uh, prediction, which is, I believe, is currently their thinking. Okay. And what, like, just clarify again, A run, B run, is there a C run? How many runs are there? What letter do they go through? For summer steelhead, just two runs, A run earlier and smaller, B run bigger and later. Are steelheads the only runs that have letters associated with their runs? Coho has an A run and a B run as well. Uh, and those are coming through right now too. So much is, to learn. There is so much to learn here. And the B run are just, they're anything bigger. It's like there's A run, which are small, like one year in ocean, right? Is that what I understand? And then B runs just anything that's been in the ocean longer or is bigger. So it, it, there's actually some genetic differences, but oh. they are unable to, ter- de- to determine those as they cross the dam. So they just base it on size. But the B run steelhead uh, come from specific basins, um, mostly out of Idaho, the Clearwater River being one of them. And the Lemhi River, which is a tributary of the Salmon River, is one of the other ones that has a B run steelhead. So I was right to call you out for this article for knowing just like a little bit about this. Yeah, this is my passion. (laughs) You're definitely right. I I have two trips on the books for for this area later in the year. And uh, it is definitely one of the most beautiful places to fish and a really, really unique fish. And so there are some biological differences. They return later because of like some biological differences from where the basin is. Is that I'm fascinated by these things. I, I think it is just an evolutionary thing that they, they return that's later. The that's the yeah. it was the wrong term. Evolutionary was the right term. And for uh, reasons unknown to me, the uh, the fish that stay out in the ocean longer uh, must have had higher survival rates in those basins in the past. And so they dominated because there are A-run fish in both of those basins as well. Um, but the B-runs have done better over time and uh, more of them have survived and kept returning. Okay. It's a great article. All of the links to these articles are in the show notes on Apple podcasts and in the Substack email, by the way, everybody's getting uh, the Substack emails. Now I've comported all friends of the underground out of my outlook into Substack so that I can be more efficient in my notification of people. Is that okay with you, Karen? It is okay. It is an approved move. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for checking with me, Bill. Yep. Yeah. I'm here for it. That's it. Okay. That's all the news we're covering this week. Send us any news, questions, opinions, or corrections to Paul on Twitter at a power manager. Or if you're a friend of the underground, send any of us a note. Any corrections from the live show, Paul? Uh, I had two corrections, uh, very important ones. First, I, I just really like screwed up you know live shows are somewhat hard and that you gotta if you don't get to edit them afterwards uh in any like really good way 
and I fumbled through my reference to Luigi Jolin when I was introducing her. I told her we were teaching her how to write, which is absurd. She's a mechanical engineering graduate from the University of Notre Dame. She's a very competent writer. But we're teaching her this very specific thing, which is how to write silly leads uh, for public power underground stories, right? To like short, somewhat silly, but very informative. It's a skill. We're teaching her that skill. She's a staff writer in training. The other thing is I screwed up. It was a bit, I, was, I, I am advocating for Karen I to be the director of member engagement. But what as I was listening back, I was like, how did I mess up? Member services? I mean, it's a thing, but member engagement feels more right to me, Karen. Doesn't member engagement, like that feels right. It feels good. I could try it on and then think it feels pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, it looks it's like that vest. It like feels nice. It feels good. Yeah, I mean, it feels good. It feels comfortable. <laughs> okay, those are my any other corrections, Karen, that you heard or caught after? No, I don't show? think so. But you're right. It's live. It's like once it happens, it happens. So you're moving on to the next thing. <laughs> yep. And you know that that is largely all of our recordings. And it's also it was the first one in like a it was a time off in between. Mm -hmm. And we we weren't we hadn't gotten any reps yet. So I'm hoping this, you know, I got I get, get our reps. Exactly. Speaking of reps, this was this was rep number one for Brian and Aaron. Y'all did great. You did. It's almost like you have an applause track for that. <laughs> and a laugh track. <laughs> and <Perfect>. a laugh track. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Karen. We'll be back next week to talk about public power and public power adjacent news. To make sure you don't miss an episode, you can sign up for an unintrusive newsletter with we links to all the ways to consume this fascinating content so and links to the news articles we chatted about on Substack at publicpowerunderground.substack.com. Otherwise, you can subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. That's all for this week. Thanks for tuning in. Roll on, enthusiasts, roll on. Roll on, enthusiasts, roll on. We're likely recruiting you to come and join on. Roll on, enthusiasts, roll on. We bring in some people way smarter than us. Those in the Public Power Underground is Northwest Public Power News from a power department's perspective, presented for entertainment purposes. It's written, edited, and produced by the power department and friends of the power department. The views expressed here are our own and not the official views of Klatskin IPUD, PPC, nor of any person or organization affiliated or doing business with Klatskin IPUD, nor the organization of guests also appearing on Public Power Underground. Neither Klatskin IPUD nor those appearing on Public Power Underground generate ad revenue from the episodes. Make two Roger and Karen feel better about their participation in this week's episode by sending them a note, text, or email with a thumbs up and telling them how much you enjoyed it. Do it for us, do it for them, and do it to make other people feel valued and appreciated. Public Power Underground for electric utility enthusiasts. Public Power Underground, it's work to watch.